Good morning. I'm Ben Ayers, Dean of the Terry College of Business, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Terry Third Thursday. This is our monthly event where we welcome alumni and students and other business leaders here to our uh, home presence here in Atlanta. This is the home of our executive MBA, our professional MBA programs, as well as our executive programs where we provide custom programs and open enrollment programs for leading companies in Atlanta and the state of Georgia and beyond. Uh, takes a lot to organize this series uh, each month. I'd like to thank our alumni board for organizing today's uh, event as well as the entire series. It's also my pleasure to thank our sponsors. If you'll join me in thanking our corporate sponsor, Synovus, as well as our two media sponsors, Atlanta Journal-Constitution and Atlanta Public Broadcasting, WABE. Let's thank them as well. So news for upcoming programs, as is our custom, we will not meet in July, so I hope everyone has a great July and celebration on the 4th. We will reconvene in August, and in August, on August 16th, we'll have Mike Plant, who is president in development for Atlanta Braves, will be here. And then on September 15th, we'll have Mark Lazarus, who's chairman of NBC Broadcasting and Sports, and I hope that you each will join us both in August and September. Things are busy on campus in Athens. Uh, tomorrow we will be having a topping out event for our uh, phase three buildings. Topping out represents we've reached the pinnacle of construction and we'll now be focusing on construction on the inside as well as the brickwork which started earlier last week. Uh, those two buildings will be finished at the end of March and so the entire business learning community be, will be finished next spring. We'll move in in June and have a dedication event September of 19. So we are nearing the end of our construction and you are all invited to come and see what our uh, new facilities in Athens look like. We are pleased to have what we think are the best facilities in the country. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Paul Bowers. Paul was named Chairman, President, and CEO of Georgia Power in 2011. Georgia Power is the largest subsidiary of the Southern Company, which is one of the nation's leading energy providers. Prior to his current role, <clears throat> Paul was CFO of Southern Company, which he joined back in 1979 at Gulf Power, and he's held many executive leadership positions at various subsidiaries for the Southern Company. Paul currently serves on a number of boards, and so here is a listing, it may be incomplete, but here is a, a pretty uh, uh, robust list. The Nuclear Electric Insurance Limited, Nuclear Energy Institute, the Atlanta Committee for Progress, AFLAC, Children's Health Care of Atlanta, the Georgia Research Alliance, Georgia Ports Authority, the Georgia Chamber of Commerce, and the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce. And Paul previously served as a member of the Board of Regents for the University System of Georgia. He is truly committed to the well-being of the citizens of Georgia, and his dedication, uh, coupled with his professional achievements, has earned him numerous accolades, and here is a sampling. The American Jewish Community's National Human Relations Award. He's also been inducted to the Junior Achievement Business Hall of Fame, and he was recently named a Georgia trustee by Governor Deal. Paul is a native of Pensacola, Florida. He's earned a BA from the University of West Florida and a master's degree from Troy University. He's also graduated from Harvard Business School's Advanced Management Program. Please join me in welcoming Paul Bowers. This morning, let me just start off and say thank you. Uh, thank you for what you're gonna do for us today. Uh, it's gonna be 96 degrees, and y'all gonna be using a lot of electricity. <laughs> And, you know, it's just wonderful to be with our customers. And, uh, and thank you for what you're going to do. You know, whenever I get out and have conversations about leadership or our business, I, you know, in forums like this, I want to engage with you. I mean, I would really want you to be part of the program instead of me just coming up here and giving you a speech about my perspective on leadership. I'll give you that. My perspective on our energy business, which I'll give you that as well. But I want you to get engaged because the best learning opportunity is for you to understand or ask the questions that might be in your mind. You know, why are you doing, why are you building a nuclear plant, right? Being 
why are we doing that in Georgia? Or why are you putting up all these solar facilities? And why are you shutting down coal plants? And those type things. Before I do that, I have a lot of my teammates here. And one in particular I want to point out, an alumni from the University of Georgia. He retired uh, this past uh, spring. He's one of my best friends in the company. It's Ron Henson. Uh, was our CFO at George Powell for, uh, for a number of years, but he worked at our company for 38 plus years. So Ron, I'm glad you're here. You know, I saw Ron this morning, I said, look, you're retired, what are you doing here? He said, well, I heard you come to speak. I said, man, I'd be in bed if I was you. What is going on? So let me give you a couple quick stories about leadership. Uh, you know, one of the things that I love to do is to go out and visit our troops. Uh, whenever we're in the mix of storms or we're just doing our day-to-day -day work, I want to know what's going on. And that's the best way to get instant feedback associated with what's going on in our business. I mean, all the rumor mills, everything that you know, they are talking about, you get it firsthand because ultimately, when you show up, they want to talk. But then if you're out there actually working with them, I mean, the barriers come down and they give you the insight that you really want to glean from them. You know, how can we make our company better? I mean, that's ultimately what we're trying to do. So from time to time, I'll sit in on the call center or our set a pole or string wire, or whatever it might be. Uh, they're very nervous when I string wire, but it, is, <laughs> but it is part of the job. On the call center, I'll get in there and you listen to the customers and you, know, you hear what they're asking for. A lot of customers need help in terms of bill arrangements and things like that. And I think we've done a great job of advancing the technology necessary to allow customers more flexibility. One customer called in, said, look, I'm retiring. I have six properties in Georgia. I want to transfer the address to Florida, where I'm retiring, and I just need to get the address to change on the six accounts. The young lady was going through all those accounts, and then she came up with one and said, oh, Mr. Smith, you're in arrears. You hadn't paid your bill on one account. And of course, he was fabricated. I've been a customer for 36 years. I always pay my bills. There's no way. Well, how much is it? She goes, well, it's $5. <laughs> and he goes, $5? What are you going to do about that? And she goes, well, I'm going to send you a bill. He goes, she goes, it's going to take, you know, probably a couple of weeks before you get the bill. And he goes, well, it's going to cost you more than $5 to get the process through. And so he's kind of fabricated that he's going to pay five bucks. So I tap on her shoulder and I said, look, let me talk to him. So she goes, Mr. Smith, our president wants to talk to you. <laughs> and, and he goes, over $5? <laughs> so, of course, I talked to him and said, okay, look, I got you covered. I gave her five bucks and said, thank you for your business for 36 bucks. But, you know, those are the kind of learning moments. Are we pushing standards and process and procedures to the point where we lose the context of what's important to a customer? I mean, that's part of leadership. I mean, understanding the needs and wants of those customers that you face with. I mean, you have those encounters, but no, the procedure says, I gotta get my $5 out. This showing from a leader standpoint, you have flexibility. You've got to own this business just like we do. And understand that transition of ownership is saying I can make decisions and take those risks on behalf of this company. And that's what we try to instill every day, to try to push the decisions down so they get an understanding that yeah, they do own this business and they can make it better, not just the people that have the titles. The other uh, story I'll tell you, I was out on a, a crew and we were st actually setting poles and you know, getting dirty and you know, there was a retiree that drives by and there's, you know, whenever you're in a bunch of crews and setting poles, there's probably three or four crews there, which means you got about 10 to 12 folks there. So the retiree, kind of like Ron, driving by, saying, man, I, might be a free cup of coffee. And uh, so he stops and wants to talk to the crews, and they're talking. And uh, one of the foremen said, have you met, pointing to me, our new apprentice? He looks at me and goes, God, y'all are starting to mold. <laughs> <laughs> so you also have to, as leaders, you have to be humble. Uh, so, you know, when you look at these learnings and those engagements, as leaders and upcoming students that are going to be leaders, don't ever lose touch with the people that are part of your team. It doesn't matter what title you have or what you know, position that you might hold because you're still part of a team. When I'm asked, you know, what position do you hold at Georgia Power, and people 
probe on that. I hate that because it doesn't matter. Well, no, what, what job do you hold at Georgia Power? Well, I'm part of the team. No, what position do you hold at Georgia Power? I mean, I get that. My response is I'm one of the coaches. But truly, because that's what position of any leader is, is a coach. I mean, you're trying to get the people around you, and we have Sloan Evans here who runs our HR uh, function for us, that really looks at what is the team. I mean, just like Kirby Smart, the number one recruiting class, or Joe Goodwin, finding the right people to put the positions in play to make a team better. And that's what leaders do. They actually are the coaches of the organization. Because at the end of the day, yeah, we have to make some decisions that are tough. But you're really trying to bring up the whole organization, trying to instill in the organization to be leaders, all of them, and that you're coaching them to be better. Because when you look at organizations' performance, and yeah, you're going to measure the bottom line, how much profit did you make, but how reliable, reliable are we, how fast did we respond in storms, but did they own it? And do they feel like they control their own destiny? And as a coach, you want them taking that block and making sure the linebacker is taken down so the running back can run through. I mean, that's the day-to-day -day leadership objective of any leader. Within Georgia Power, I really tried to say for us, I want leaders who lead. I don't care what position you hold, I want you to be a leader. Because, yeah, you, you can be a supervisor, you can be a foreman, you can be a manager, you can be a director, you can be a vice president, senior vice president, executive vice president, or whatever. But if you're sitting in a cubicle and you feel like you can't do anything but because you have somebody you have to check with, think about the speed of the organization when that happens. Is it fast? Is it moving? with ease? No, there's bottlenecks. And that's what drives customers absolutely crazy, is when they say, well, I got to check with somebody. And that's where you've got to instill this leadership ownership perspective in any organization. Now for us, you know, we have a lot of opportunities and challenges within our business. We're going through this massive transition. Uh, energy is getting more dispersed where customers have a little bit more control in terms of what decisions they're making around energy. Not necessarily, am I going to choose Georgia Power or not, but am I going to put a generator on the back end of my building? Or am I going to put a solar panel on my roof? Or do I want to have a microgrid where I can contain my industry, where I can just sep separate from Georgia Power if I need to? And those are things that are driving the changes within our business. And we are looking at how to be more and more efficient and how to be uh, more responsive to those needs. So, you know, our response to that is if you want to generate in the back of your facility, we want to own it. If you want a uh, solar panel on the rooftop, even though it's not economic, we want to own it. If you want a solar panel in the back field to serve a residential uh, development, we want to own that. Because it's not, the equation is no longer a central station power plant. Yeah, that's going to be the backbone of the ener energy infrastructure, but it's going to be where customers have more control in ensuring the reliability of their own personal facility, be it a house, be it a, be it a business. And yeah, when you look at that equation and you step back and say, okay, what are the decisions we got to make for the next 10, 20, 30 years? Because our horizon is the 30 to 50 year horizon for our decision making. What do we need to be in and what kind of people do we need on the team and what is the transition that we have to make within our business? So we're making some tough decisions. Tough decisions of closing down some of our bill payment offices. I mean, that in and of itself was a pinnacle decision for the company because it did change perspectives. I mean, this is what we've always done. We were in every community in the state we're not leaving those communities. We're just not going to have a bill payment office. Why? 97% of our customers want to transact business either through an app or online. So why do we have 134 offices out there open? And it's just real estate then. And the transactions just became more of a comfort than actually having an interface with a customer that really wants to be there. So we changed that. And we shut all these offices down. You would have thought we had opened up the Third World War in George Powell. Because that's fundamental of who we were. We've always had these offices. 
And when you get that entrenched with the past, you're blinded to the future. You're not open to the transition that you might be going through. And to me, that was such a pinnacle decision for us because it made the fundamental change that things are different, yet they're moving faster than they ever thought would be. So we're moving. We're moving, offering all kind of opportunities. We now have a Georgia Power marketplace where you can go online and buy appliances or equipment or whatever, and we can send it to you just like Amazon overnight, get it to you. And we're offering alternatives in terms of how you want to interact with us from a, a, a purchase of electricity. I mean, if you have an electric vehicle, we got one cents a kilowatt hour at night if you want to plug in. Or if you just want a steady state bill, we can give that to you. Mass customization for our, our customers is on, on foot for everyone in this room. But we are at the forefront of what the economy is going to demand for all of us. Being nimble, acting with speed, but we have to have a team that's self-confident to make those transitions. And that's what we're instilling within George Bauer. Now let me go to a couple of topics around a nuclear plant. Uh, and then I'll go to the airport because I'm sure y'all want to talk about that. Uh, I don't, but I will talk to you. But, uh, so when you think about uh, the nuclear plant, the decision that was made in 2004 to say, is that the right decision? I want you all to take a snapshot 2004. America was moving forward on restri uh, restricting CO2 in America. You know, we got to get emissions down to try to reduce the overall emission rate in vehicles and or power plants around America. That was the goal. When you look at the economics of a nuclear plant at that point in time, it was over eight to ten billion dollars of value for the customers themselves. But that was with a gas price at a certain price that was going to uh, grow over time, six to twelve bucks. And then we saw volatility around that ga gas price. And what the Public Service Commission ultimately decided is we don't want to take that volatility to our customers because you want some steady state. We also don't want to have fuel costs going up and down. So let's find a way to resolve not only the fuel equation, but give more certainty about uh, what the price of energy is going to be in the future. So we went down this endeavor. 2008, we filed with the Public Service Commission to get approval. 2009, we filed with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to get approval from the federal government to go forward with that. And in 2009, the Georgia Public Service Commission said this is the best economic choice for our customers. Boom. We start the process can't really start the process until the NRC says you got to go. So we can clear a site. We can start having negotiations or finalize negotiations with Westinghouse and Toshiba to ensure that we have this fixed price contract to protect our customers and do those things. So we started clearing the site in 2010, 2011, what happened? March of 2011, I'm in London giving, uh, still doing some of the financial stuff for the Southern Company, giving a talk and we have a Fukushima event. NRC said, let's stop the process, ensure that we have the protections necessary that something like that couldn't happen in America with these constructions of new nuclear plants. So let's look at the shield building, which had been the, the issue of the day. What is the shield building? Well, you think about a reactor that's sitting in the middle. I, I'm going to get it back to the real simple. All we're trying to do is create heat to turn a turbine. Put water in it, create steam, turn a turbine. So it could be coal, it could be gas, this happens to be uranium that creates the heat. So you've got to control it. So you have a reactor, then you have a, the vessel around that, then you have a building around that, and then you have another layer of protection called the shield building. Well, the NRC said, let's look at the shield building to ensure that if a 747 went directly into the plant, that it can be protected. Okay? All the calculations known to man were calculated. Yeah, it can be protected. So. Now, we expected that the license to come out in 11. Now it's now uh, the first quarter of 2012. They finally say, go build your plant, 2012. So when you hear this plant's behind schedule over budget, and I'll give you some budget minute. Yeah, it is behind the original schedule from 2008. But every step of the way, it had to have regulatory approval that also gives you a different schedule. Okay, so that aspect needs to be clarified. Exactly. Uh, but, uh, Anyway, so you go fast forward, we go through the construction process, and then you start seeing the labor markets change. What does that mean? 
Think about it. We haven't built a nuclear plant in 32 years in America. 32 years in America. And in fact, we have 104 reactors in the United States. We've announced 12 of those are going to retire. And we're actually going backwards in terms of emission rates on power plants. We need new nuclear in America. Guess what? What do you think the world's doing today? There's 72 nuclear plants being built today around the globe. 30 plus are being built in China. You have 10 plus in Russia. You got seven in India. You got four in the UAE. And we have one in America. Think about where the world's going. So all this is happening. But the craft skills within the United States are not the same as they were in the 70s. So guess what? We had to build up that workforce, how to weld. In a nuclear environment, it's different. I mean, I take Larry Gillerstad or all the big construction guys, Tommy Holder, down to the nuclear plant, and they're amazed at the craft skill level that's needed. Everything's checked. Every pour of concrete has to be checked by the NRC. Every weld is measured and, and, and looked at from an x-ray standpoint. And if a rebar is said it's going to, be uh, going to be turned at a wall at 90 degrees, it better be 90 degrees. It can't be 89. Structurally, it doesn't matter. But your design says 90, it better be 90. So all aspects of that. So how do you get perfection in construction? And have the level of skills necessary to build a nuclear plant at the level that Americans says this is what we want to protect the citizens of the United States. Fast forward. We're building this thing. Yeah, and the commission said originally uh, we'll approve $4.4 billion. And guess what? In 2016, they upped that by $1 billion dollars to $5.4 billion. Why? NRC changed the cybersecurity standards for the plant. That costs uh, two to three hundred million dollars. Uh, they also changed the configuration relative to the shield building that cost another six, seven hundred million dollars. Regulatory approval, five point four billion dollars is a prudent expenditure for us to go forward. Move forward. Now, 2017. As I call 2017 from a nuclear build standpoint, the hell year for America. Why? The contractor that was building this plant goes bankrupt. Bankrupt. Westinghouse, of all people, goes bankrupt. One of the iconic brands of America. But the decisions they were making to take on some of the risk and how they managed the process put them in bankruptcy. Guess who owned Westinghouse? Toshiba or Toshiba, you can say either way. Their knees buckled. They had some other issues in Japan, so we absolutely started interfacing with the Japanese government to ensure that our parent guarantee was going to be paid. What's the parent guarantee? 40% of the contracted price they had to pay, $3.7 billion, the backstop for the customers. Last, last year, during September, they said we're going to pay it. Got a check, written check, $3.7 billion in December. That's a huge deal because when we think about price to our customers, when we originally filed this back in 2008, we said it's going to be an 8 to 10% increase in rates over time. Then we started getting DOE loan grants, uh, investment tax credits, things that the government said, let's incent America to go build these plants again. That brought that price down to 6%. And then with the bankruptcy and the process we had to go through, we increased the price again just because now we have full transparency of what else uh, Westinghouse was covering on their nickel. Now we have to cover it on our nickel. It went up another, roughly another a billion five on the project. So we're at 7.3 billion total. And they paid $3.7 billion for all the owners. Our portion of it's 1.7. Our price for this project is coming in at 9.2, 9.4, 9.6% range, below 10%. For an asset that's going to be here for 50 to 80 years, that's producing energy at one cent a kilowatt hour, is that the right decision for Georgia? And if you go back in history and you think about, well, what happened when you built Volga 1 and 2? Yeah, we had the same kind of issues. Everybody in America was building nuclear plants. NRC was changing the standards because of what? Three mile island. And those three mile island changes caused the prices to go up. But today, Vogel 1 and 2, 
is the bedrock of our energy infrastructure for Georgia. It's why we can grow. It's why we are attracting economic opportunities for the state with low energy costs. We're 15 percent below the national average in energy costs. And everybody that is energy intensive loves that number. And for us, when you think about where we stand, our industrial rates are 20 percent plus below the national average. You as residential customers are around 15 percent below the national average. Commercial customers are a little bit higher than that. It's about 12, 10 to 12 percent below the national average. But that's what we want for the long term. So the decision around Vogel gives you confidence that you can have a different energy mix, be it gas, be it solar, whatever, because you've got a, a plant that's running 95% of the time, always there producing energy at that level. So there's the decisions. Now, we're in the middle of executing. We've got to execute. We've got to build it. Have we made progress? Absolutely. Has the productivity improved? Yes. Got Bechtel in there. They're doing a great job. But we still need 1,600 electricians. And we still need pipe fitters. And America's not producing those. And we're going to the border now and working with the U.S. government to get, they got 5,000 electricians that are not working in Canada. You know, that is the issue for us. And when we engage on a local basis or we engage in the university system, and I talk to kids about the future, if you're not apt to go to college, man, we'd love you to go to technical school. And you can make $100,000 to $150,000 a year being a welder or an electrician. And I go out on the site, and I see people that have, and I, I'm not going to tell you what kind of degrees they have, and they're not from the University of Georgia. But they, they say, look, I can make more money being a welder here at this site than using my degree. We've got to get kids interested back in the crafts, and it's not a bad thing. We have demonized that aspect of our society that, you know, it's below us. And those are the people I love. That's why I love working with our line crews. They're the ones that make it happen. And if I look at what I do on a daily basis, I'd rather be with them because they're doing something for a customer every day. I'm an impediment to what they do. And we've got to recognize that. So let's go fast forward to airport which was another great day. Uh, I get a call on Sunday afternoon, said, look, we got an issue out at the airport. Airport has a outage going on. We had a switch failure and we got a fire. How bad is it? Well, one of the concourses is down, but could it affect the whole airport? Of course, it affect the whole airport. Um, and the fire itself didn't allow us to get into the utility tunnel until about 450, 450 or so and finally, when we got in, we got uh, the international concourse up by 651 to be exact, and then the rest of the concourse is up by 10, 1052. Not that I know these numbers very well, but uh, <laughs> but the that you know that aspect of it was something that also highlighted the expectation of reliability on our business. What else can we do to ensure reliable service? Because that gave everybody a question: Are we as liable, reliable as we should be? Yeah, I can give you all the excuses and everything else. I'm not going to do that. It's, you know, it's the process. You know, yeah, we have all the cables that serve from two different substations in one tunnel. Why is it there? Well, that's the way the airport said we had to put it. Well, why didn't we push harder? Well, they didn't want to pay for another couple hundred million dollars. Well, what else can we do? Well, we can put generation on the back side. Who owns the generation? Well, the airport owns the generation. How'd they do during this outage? And our position from a company standpoint is we want to own that generation. If we're going to have a brand impact, I don't want to rely on somebody else that's going to perform or not. And so we're working with the, the city and the airport and the air carriers uh, to ensure that we own those generators and we'll size them right. We're monitoring, maintain, and operate those uh, facilities to ensure that Atlanta never has that happen again. But I'm pushing like crazy for speed. Let's make a decision. And that is the aspect that we're really up against. Let's move this forward and make sure that we get it handled. So all those opportunities, you think about, man, nuclear plant, outages at the airport. What do leaders do? And as a leader, you've got to instill in everybody this, this desire to be better 
every day. Not, okay, I did good today, and that's good enough. What am I going to do tomorrow? And how am I going to get excel tomorrow? And then the day after. And how do you keep that momentum and that desire to be best? When we show up our position relative to our peers and everybody else to try to get the same thing as the SEC. You know, are you number one in the East? Are you number one in the West? Are you nationally ranked? We do the same thing with business. How well are we doing relative to our peers? And is that a rallying cry? Absolutely. But it gets back to the individuals within our company that says, I want to be better than the average. I want to be the number one. And that's what a coach and a leader of any organization has to instill. Motivate for excellence. And instill this balance of, I want to strive for excellence, but I also want to give back to something in the community. And as I close, that's one of the things that I'm most proud of, of Georgia Power. I mean, we've been engaged over 135 years as a company in this state. And we had this mantra from our original first president that said, we're going to be a citizen wherever we serve. And engage in the communities to make them better because we're there. To ensure that economic prosperity comes to all. And I can tell you today, our employees are doing much more than you could ever imagine. 150,000 hours of dedicated volunteer service last year. $17 million given back to the community. And now today, Sloan and our team are about to roll out uh, this platform for our employees called Purposity. It's purpose with generosity, the combination of, of both. Where if your neighbor needs something, and this is really for an educational platform, you would do something, and you know you would. Well, what about the school down the street? If you knew a young little girl didn't have shoes, or the shoes that she's wearing didn't fit, or the shoes were ragged, or she didn't have a coat, what would you do? If you knew about it, you'd do something, right? I mean, it's 12 bucks. Proposity will give that, us that platform to engage as an app on a weekly basis. How do you connect to your communities real time and ensure that you know about that little girl or you know about the needs of your community or that you know about the needs of that educational system. That's who George Power is. That's the one that I love waving, waving the flag. Yeah, the lights are going to be on and you're going to be great customers today. It's wonderful. But giving back and having a heart is something that every organization has to strive for. It's not about the profit. Yeah, it is for the shareholders that own you, but they also see there's something that you're giving back. And when you give back, it's unbelievable what it does for the team because they feel connected and they feel like it's bigger than the bottom line. So with all that, I want to engage with you. So what's on your mind? And I'll answer the power bill questions if you have a problem. Okay. <laughs> We Thank you. have uh, a microphone, I believe. Uh, so if you'll raise your hand and wait for the mic, so that we are we are recording this. And, uh, Thanks, Paul. I, yeah. I am a little behind on my bill. If we could talk afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's important today. Now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you for being here. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, EMPs, uh, infrastructure security, attacks by bad guys? I know it happens, or, or if they, they try to get into our grid. What are we doing to keep the grid secure and, and the infrastructure up? Well, that, uh, you know, cybersecurity is one of the you know, pinnacle issues that we all face, right? Uh, be it with our credit cards or whatever happens like at Equifax or whatever uh, might be impending. We get hit between two and three million times a day. A day. People are trying to probe, try to set something in to try to displant uh, a, a beacon, if you will, within the system. Uh, within that, uh, we have all the protections necessary, and we're part of the Homeland Security, all the initials that you want, FBI and everybody else, that are engaged with us. We have cyber security experts that are constantly looking at the upgrade of our networks. You know, as we become more and more digital, we become more and more vulnerable, right? So what we have to look at is what are our critical infrastructure centers? 
you know, quite frankly, there's some stuff I can't tell you, but I will tell you, you think about downtown Atlanta around, you know, the infrastructure for running this city, you know, there's a lot of protection. Uh, the infrastructure around the airport, believe it or not, is uh, also another critical infrastructure. Around our nuclear plants, absolutely, uh, is, you know, something that we protect. We actually don't have systems that talk outside of a nuclear plant, so they can't, you know, really can't do anything in terms of coming in. I mean, uh, we've had plants up in New England that got infected, uh, yeah, and of course the whole industry ran around it. So there is a, a um, infrastructure council where the utilities, financial systems, and telecom have joined together in collaborating on what is the protections we need for the infrastructure of America. And that meets on a routine basis and we're constantly upgrading our systems. Believe it or not, the Israelis are the ones that provide a lot of our network protections because they're constantly looking at, they're being attacked, you know, as you would imagine, all the time. They have commercialized a lot of that uh, infrastructure. So, you know, you can sleep secure that the air conditioning is going to run, but we're constantly on guard to ensure that it does. Okay. Hey. You got a question over here. Yeah. Um, regulated utility is not something that people associate with excellent customer service all the time, but um, after having moved my house last year, I'm a pretty big fan of you guys. The move was smooth. Most of our other utilities weren't. We even had a tree hit uh, the pole in front of our house. Uh, your crew was the first one out there. Um, they not only restored the power, but they checked to make sure the line to our house hadn't pulled loose. Love the fact that you guys attach the bill to the emails that we get. Love the new uh, energy efficiency reports. But tell me, tell us a little bit more. I know you talked about what you guys have done, but Tell us a little bit more about some of the challenges you face as a regulated utility in providing um, those great experiences and, um, and as well as some of the additional opportunities that you see. Uh, great question. So um, let me ask uh, the crowd. I, I know, William, you're still in school, right? Anybody else that's in, still in school in here? I mean, be proud of it. Yeah. <laughs> Raise your hand. Um, would you want to work for the utility? Why? Well, you're going to have to speak up. <laughs> uh, I don't, I, I don't know. Nah, it's not top of mind, right? Okay, William, what about you? He's getting a finance real estate degree. Um, we got finance, we got real estate. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, but usually, you know, there, when I speak to MBA students, uh, and have conversation, you know, I want to go to New York or be on Wall Street or I want to do uh, investment banking or I want to do something that, you know, jazz. I don't want to work for a utility. Why? Well, that's boring. You know, that's the challenge for us is the image of a regulated utility. Now, why are we regulated? Um, you go back uh, through decades and decades, you know, the capital intensity of our business basically forced the, the decision to be regulated where there's rate regulation uh, because of the amount of money we had to spend to ensure that we have reliable service. We spend, okay, you ready? We spend between three and five billion dollars a year, capital. Now, some of my board members, when we go to a power plant and see a, the, um, uh, take Bowen or a shear or a coal plant with all the environmental equipment on the back end of it, you know, we're spending uh, at Bowen $3.2 billion on the back end of a plant. Uh, Clyde Tuggle, some of y'all know Clyde from Coca-Cola, he says, well, we invest in bottling plants, you know, two to three hundred million dollars, we expect to have a payback in two to five years, max. Five year max. We want that payback quick. For us, we spread that cost out for 30 years, the life of the asset. The regulated side of that says, we don't want to have the rate shock for all this capital that you're putting in, so we're gonna spread all this out. And for that, we'll give you a economic incentive called the return on equity, because we have to go attract investment in our business to go out and get shareholders and to be attractive for the debt holders, because we have to finance all this stuff. 
we got to be attractive, so they'll give you a, a ROE that some say, well, you're making so much money. Yeah, if we were unregulated, let's have the rate shock. But that can't happen because you don't want that either. So that's, you know, the regulated piece of why we are regulated. Cause, and also, you don't want, think about right now, in Buckhead, they love us with our wires, of, you know, going down the street. That's being facetious. But do you want both sides of the road with wires down the street with multiple players? You're trying to get your service. I mean, that was part of the decision way back when. Now, you know, there's competition that they, we become a universal service provider and we charge everybody for using our wires. You know, that could happen. But, you know, our desire is we are measured from a public service commission who sets our rates and a standard, if you will, of having a level of customer service that uh, uh, equates to a return on equity. Our view is you give me a, an incentive to be the best we can be, give me a pop on the ROE side of this. And that's where I'm driving our company. Let's in, escalate the opportunity for earnings by us being excellent at every, everything we do. That means from finance or from real estate, how are we managing our business? How are we being innovative in terms of technology deployment? I mean, we have stuff it's unbelievable for customers. I mean, batteries in the basement that's going to sit there and charge up for you at night. Or if you're going to have, you know, a solar panel, you know, the, the financing of that and making sure that's happening. Or the technology that's going to transform the interface with you in terms of day-to-day -day communication. You might want hour-by-hour -hour pricing. Hey, we can do that. We do that for industrial customers right now. Hour-by-hour. -hour. And they manage your production based on that. We can do that for y'all. That is what's exciting. And then you get to the coming up graduates. They get exposed to all this innovation and opportunities and the social media platforms that we have and all those type of things. We start attracting talent within the business. And that's where we got to get more and more momentum. Because I do come into rooms where they don't have a clue except the nomenclature of a regulated utility I don't know if I want to work there. And then they all of a sudden say, oh, energy. And what's going on in the transformation of America and how we handle SO2 or NOx or CO2 and the technology to do all that. Now, I have to tell you a quick story. You know, when I was in the operations role of Southern Company, um, we were out in Caltech. Um, Caltech has, you know, some of the best research platforms out there. Uh, MIT, Caltech, you know, George Tech's engaged in some of this. We have uh, our chief environmental officer was uh, MIT PhD, uh, chemical engineer, undergrad in Auburn. Uh, graduated from Auburn at 19, went to MIT. Here's a fact. He played football for MIT. I didn't even know they had a football team. <laughs> you know, think about the huddle on that game. <laughs> you know, but anyway. So we're out with... Uh, out with Caltech and, and Larry, uh, our uh, environmental officer sitting next to me, and the, and the professor that was looking at how to capture CO2. It's out there, right? How do you capture it? He was doing a, he's a, uh, a Nobel laureate in chemical engineering, so he's a pretty bright guy. He's doing a calculation on the wall. You know, here's what we gotta do, blah, blah, blah. I'm following that. I look at Larry, I said, and he's MIT and this is Caltech. I said, I don't think that calculation's right. Larry looked at me and go, oh my God. Starts writing it down, going through the calculation, comes back and goes, no, that's right. That's why I was just checking you. I just want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, go back to all that. You know, there's so much going on, and that's what we got to expose, and that's the challenge for Sloan in terms of, you know, how do we position our company beyond the triangle that you see on the trucks that go down the road? And that's our challenge, and we, we recognize that. I work for Burns and McDonald. Um, we've been working with you guys for a long time. We're actually involved in... 135 uh, years? Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> but we are involved with uh, Plant Vogel, so I know what it means to really put together deliverables for a nuclear plant compared to an ordinary uh, project. But outside of Vogel, what is the number one thing that really keeps you awake at night? You know, um, you know I, I get those questions a lot about what keeps you up at night. You know, really nothing. 
I mean, we get as leaders an opportunity to, um, to look a portfolio of issues uh, a bit in the nuclear plant or is there going to be an outage at one of our other plants or we're not going to serve our customers at the airport or whatever. I have confidence in our team. And, you know, if we have the right people in the right job, you know, the proverbial right people on the bus, uh, that gives you comfort. I mean, that goes back to that coach, right? You got the right quarterback or not? Do you have the right running back? Uh, I mean, that, that's for the opportunity for them to excel. And then I measure that, of course. But, I, you know, I don't lose sleep in the sense of an expectation that there's something that's going to happen that's going to cause our company to collapse. You know, I worry about the financing and what new regulation might come down the road or how our customers might want different things in the future. And are we moving with speed? That's a different than having stress and not being able to sleep. Okay. Jim. Paul, you mentioned that nuclear is the backbone of the energy generation, but talk a little bit about the role of coal, wood chips, and hydroelectric in the mix. Okay. So when you think about the energy infrastructure of Georgia, you got to think about all the stuff we have, right? So, you know, we have nuclear, we got hydro, we got coal, we got gas, we have uh, solar. Give you percentages. That might be easy uh, to give you perspective. Or the best way to tell you is through the economic uh, signals that each one of these generating sources provide. Now we had in 2007, 70 percent of the energy in Georgia was produced by coal. Today it's less than uh, less than 28 percent today. Um, so every day, every morning at four o'clock, our generation resource uh, team looks at the load today is going to be around 38,000 megawatts. What does that mean? A lot, which is great. Uh, so um, they're stacking all the generation to ensure that we're economically dispatching the generation resources that are available. So because of the rain, hydro's out. We have about 3,000 megawatts of hydro that's being produced on a daily basis that we run. Some of that we reserve because of emergency, uh, you know, hold it back for reserves. Uh, what if we needed 40,000 instead of 38? I mean, that's the kind of stuff we have to worry about. The next set of generation. Now, hydro, think on a variable cost, how much fuel cost there is in hydro? Zero. It rains, we got it. So it goes through a turbine. Boom. It's spinning a turbine. That's all you're doing. So it's zero. And it's, if it's available, it's going to be produced. And that helps you keep prices down. The next set of generation, we have plant Vogel, plant Hatch, and plant Farley in Alabama. They come up next. They're at 0.8 cents a kilowatt hour to 1.1 cents a kilowatt hour. That's 6,000 uh, 6, megawatts roughly for Georgia. Online. They're always online. It's, you know, in the spring we get some outages, but they're there. The next set of generation, we have roughly anywhere between 18 to 20,000 megawatts of gas. Combined cycle gas is the next cheapest generation source that we have in our fleet. It's producing energy between 2.2 2 .2 to 2.6 cents a kilowatt hour, depending on the efficiency of the turbine. So you think about it, boom, your hydro, nuclear, now the next fuel source that's cheapest is natural gas. After that, you have shear, plant shear in Macon, Georgia, and you have a plant in Alabama called Miller, they burn what is called uh, a Powder River Basin coal. It's the cheapest coal available. Low emission rate, but it's really cheap. The only reason it's uh, cheap is they produce so much of it, it's $8 a ton. But the transportation cost is roughly 28 to 30 bucks, so you got to get it here. It's producing energy between 2.8 to 3.2 cents a kilowatt hour. So those plants are on. After that, it's all whatever the loads are. You know, we'll call in a Bowen, uh, which is pr uh, producing energy between 3.4 and 3.8 cents a kilowatt hour. It's used in Illinois Basin coal, but its capacity factor has dropped from where it was running about 80 percent of the time. It's running between 40 and 50 percent of the time now. Plant Hammond in Rome, Georgia, some of y'all know that plant. It's running 5 percent of the time. It's just not running. Economic you know, indicator, if you will, because of the price. It's just we don't turn it on. So that's what's happening in our fleet. Then we have what we call peaker units, which are, uh, think about a jet engine on a plane. They just run about 5% of the time, 
whenever we have extreme weather conditions, really, really cold or really, really hot. And they come in, they run about 12 cents a kilowatt hour. I mean, they're really, uh, really, really expensive. And so we don't run them unless we need them. Does that help? Yeah. Oh. Uh, I forgot about solar. Uh, solar's in there. Now, what's unique about solar, I'll come right back, um, is greenfield utility scale solar is the most economic choice for customers. We're getting solar fields, 50 megawatts, which basically is about 300 acre field uh, with energy coming out of it, three and a half to four and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Rooftop solar, now in the state of Georgia, there's about 1,200 rooftop solar um, applications on customers' facilities. Think about it. That tells you something, right? 1,200. That's the people that just want them. The cost of that is 15 to 18 cents a kilowatt hour. Okay. John. Uh, I live in South Georgia, and So the license on that one, that's a good question, John. Hatch was the first one for Georgia. Uh, it, we've asked for a, life, a license extension. Uh, so its life uh, expectancy is over at 60 years. Uh, NRC will make a determination associated with, uh, with it. So when you think about a plant that has 60 years, don't ever imagine that everything in that plant is 60 years old. Uh, I mean, it's been maintained, it's been updated, motors, pumps, all the valves, everything else is new. Uh, we we're going to ask for another 20 years out of that plant. So we'll try to get it to 80 years. So it is critical. Go back to that dispatch. It's part of that 0.8 to 1.1 cents per kilowatt hour. And that's what makes us competitive. Having it running, that's a big deal. So it has, you know, the economic impact of that area for that plant, you know, 800 to 1,000 folks over that plant, um, you know, and making great, Wages, man, it's an economic engine for those areas. Yes, sir. You've made the comment a couple times about wanting to own generation equipment. Uh, legislation in 2015 allows non-utility providers to install, own, operate solar equipment and then sell that power to users. How do you guys think about that? the role that they're going to play, whether they're a complement to your business, a burden to your business, what do you think about those entities existing and, and providing that service? Yeah, so uh, absolutely. If there's, you know, generators out there, so, you know, we're the fifth largest solar state in America. You probably didn't know that. And again, that's another uh, tip that we need to uh, exploit a little bit more. But uh, what, 80 percent, uh, Jamie, where are you? About 80 percent of that's owned by other people. Yeah, uh, so the developers go out and build these plants. We're taking the offtake of that. Why? If you can produce it at three cents or three and a half cents, and I don't have to run a Hammond or a plant that's costing four or five cents, let's have it. Only issue with solar is intermittent. Uh, the aspect of managing that is critical. Uh, during cloudy days, it's like an EKG. I mean, it's up and down, up and down, up and down. And you gotta make sure, you know, for the industrial customers, they don't want to see their motors have these fluctuations on voltage. And we got to maintain all that stuff. So we're managing all that. But we are seeing them as partners, not as competitors. I mean, I want them to own more of it. But also recognize, you know, we have a regulatory compact in the state that allows for, you know, an 80-20 split. We can own 20% and the rest of it we bid out for the other 80%. I mean, if you can produce it at a cheap price, have at it. We're going to buy it from you. I want it cheaper, though. Uh, I mean, a lot of people don't r know this. Uh, you know, Vogel is co-owned. Uh, we own 45% of it. Uh, the co-ops and municipals own the other 55%. This is round numbers. And the city of Dalton. Uh, the city of Dalton owns 1.6%. Uh, I think that's the number. Uh, why? Again, they're, they're looking at their energy infrastructure and how can they produce energy for their customers. But not only is Vogel one and two, Vogel three and four, 
and Wansley and other facilities in our plant, we've got a joint venture, if you will, with the co-ops in the state. So the energy infrastructure is kind of a joint planned process that we're looking for the future and what is the best economic choices. You know, the option for OPC, Oglethorpe Power, and for the Municipal Electric Authority of Georgia is to evaluate their needs and wants and see if we come together. The transmission system, the big wires of Georgia, uh, are jointly owned between us and the co-ops. Again, that makes more economic sense than a bunch of people running, you know, uh, transmission lines all over the state. So a lot of that was driven by some of the issues that we had back in the 70s with all this capital that was being produced for all these plants. You know, uh, Georgia Power actually got stressed uh, and we needed to have co-owners to come in to help us finish off these plants. And OPC and MEA came in and joint uh, said, hey, this is a great opportunity for us, let's come in. So it's critical. I think, you know, more and more having that joint planning is, is critical. Okay, a couple more and then we'll, we'll shut it off. Hey, hey, Paul, thanks for the talk. Uh, <clears throat> we had a few questions about solar, so I think we covered the basics. Um, been hearing a lot about places like California who th through uh, solar and battery combination are trying to move towards a completely neutral grid and they have a pretty aggressive timeline. Um, in places like Georgia, is your perspective that they are being realistic there or is it kind of a wait and see game? Or are you trying to move Georgia eventually to that model uh, or do you think they're uh, kind of out of their minds? <laughs> <laughs> um, again, this stuff's being recorded so I gotta be careful. Uh, you know, let me give you the economic uh, perspective on California uh, and the energy policy that they put uh, in place. You know, their utilities have gone bankrupt twice uh, through the process of what they did and deregulation and everything else. So that gives you perspective of how my view would become, right? Uh, but they have aspirations to be a zero emission economy. That's fine if it makes economic sense. Um, so what's going on in California, they put in place mandates. Uh, so originally they said we want a third of the generation to be s or renewables, wind or solar. And they mandated that for the utility. Didn't matter what cost. Guess what the average cents per kilowatt hour is out there. If you use over 500 kilowatt hours, which all of us in this room do, you're paying 38 cents a kilowatt hour. And if you go above that, another 500, you're in the 50 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, so those mandates, you know, do that. And if you go talk to the industrial base, they're moving out. You know, some of the uh, intellectual businesses, you know, the Apples and then Silicon Valley are still there, but they're also trying to bridge out of there. Amazon, be, not Amazon, but uh, the Googles and the others, uh, Facebooks and those guys are, are looking for another way to uh, produce their product uh, or serve their product, if you will. So I'm against mandates, but I'm for the aspect of the combination of solar and, and batteries, if they can forge that forward to make it economic for us, we'll wait and watch. But they're gonna pay that price in the interim. And that aspect of development is an incentive for a lot of us to watch and see what they do. You know, the other dynamic that's out there is that, you know, those mandates have perverse actions. And those actions are not necessarily the best option for the customer. And that's what they not, they really don't get. Our view is let the economics drive those decisions. You know, when they were doing mandates, we were seeing 17 cents a kilowatt hour uh, for solar. Now we're purchasing at three. Uh, we didn't make any big bets on solar until it got below uh, seven cents. And then boom, all of a sudden that incentive came about. I just think, you know, you gotta watch the economic signals versus the government mandate signals, which one's right. We'll take advantage of the mandate because they'll learn something, but they're gonna pay the price for it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Paul, thanks for coming again. Brandon Lowe, 2004. Uh, transitioning to general business principles, yeah. maybe at the end. You said you're making decisions based on a 30 year timeline. Right. Can you talk a little bit about the process that you go through to determine what's going to be happening 30 years from now and how you do that? Does it get a little bit clearer when you get maybe a little bit above the day today or? It's clear as mud. Sure. So, uh, <laughs> you know, you think about 
the economic inputs that we have to consider in, in making 30-year decisions and you know big bets, if you will, in terms of capital expenditures. It's really driven by our projection of the economic viability of Georgia or the Southeast in general. You know, what's going to happen here, what our growth uh, is going to happen in terms of uh, the number of inward migration and just economic prosperity of the state. You know, we measure that real time. Then we project out with the Fed in terms of their economic forecasts with everybody to try to determine. We also get input from the industrial customer to say, you know, what's your 5, 10, 20 year horizon for these different plants? So we're getting that economic signals. But also on the research side, when, go back to the question of the mandates and technology, what about the technology changes? You know, we're measuring uh, penetration of electric vehicles. You know, electric vehicle to us is just like a heat pump in terms of energy consumption. It, it's at night, but what is the penetration going to be on electric vehicles? You know, right now it's about 0.7%. We project it to be in the 5% uh, percent range in the 2030 perspective. So we're measuring the energy consumption associated with that. On the other side, we're looking at you as individuals. What is the energy efficiency of the homes? What about the equipment that's being installed? Uh, what is the efficiency of a refrigerator today versus tomorrow? And what's the replacement time frame for that to happen? So all that is being modeled to determine an outcome of energy needs and infrastructure. Then we think about the aspect of the wire side. Uh, distributed generation resources, you know, own the generation at the airport as an example. I mean, I can microgrid that airport, separate it from Georgia, and keep it isolated from anything else that happens. How much is that going to happen within our business? Make a projection and an estimate about the technology that's going to be deployed and do we need to spend as much on wires as we thought we might need to for the future? how much batteries, how much is it going to be isolated, those type of things. So we're making all those projections. At the same time, we have to think about what's the environmental standards for all these plants. Uh, yeah, it, gas is less emission than a coal plant, but sooner or later you're going to have a CO2 rule. And gas is 50% less than a coal plant, but it still has CO2 being emitted. So how do you capture that? What technology is going to be available? And what's the price associated for that? Is it going to be three, five, ten billion dollars? And what is the horizon of that? Go back to the Caltech, MIT, why we're involved in all these universities. We need, need to know when that's going to be a breakthrough and be economic signals. So we have to make a projection on that. We have a program that shows PRISM. Uh, uh, it's called PRISM, but it shows kind of the horizon for regulation and technology crossovers and what the potential price would be and then how much more nuclear you might need how much more solar, what about you know, wires coming out of the Midwest for wind. So all those inputs go into the 30-year horizon. And then ultimately, you've got to make a bet on the economic value of your business. What's the cost of debt? What's the cost of equity? What do you think the regulation, regulatory environment is going to be for that investment? Can you make an adequate return for your investors? And then what is your capital spend going to be over that? Long story to say there's a lot of inputs. <laughs> but it is something that's very viable for us to imagine, you know, 5, 10, 20, 30 years out and think about the technology that's going to change the way we do business. And as leaders, I want every uh, leader in our company, every individual, to understand that. And we try to communicate, 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 and ensure there's transparency about these types of decisions. I don't want anybody to be surprised that technology is going to be transformative and it might do something to how we do our business, i.e., closing the local offices. Why didn't people see that coming? Because it was there. We've got to be communicating all the time and got to be transparent. But as leaders, think about the opportunity to push your organization to have leaders that lead. Also, how do you balance the heart of an organization to ensure that it's more than just the profit motivation? It's been great being with you. I enjoyed the conversation with all of y'all. I hope you learned something this morning. So thanks.
Paul, thank you for being here today and for your service uh, in our communities and your leadership and the impact that Georgia Power is having on our state. Uh, as many or most of you know, the state of Georgia has been ranked the number one state in which to do business the last five years. That would not be possible without Georgia Power. So thank you for being with us today. I've got a nice red and black uh, <laughs> sculpture for you to commemorate today, well, but thank, thank you. you for being here. Absolutely. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. I also made a mental note that Georgia Power is hiring. So we've got 2,500 graduates each year from the Terry College of Sloan. We can talk afterwards to make sure that we are fulfilling all of your business graduate needs. Um, as I mentioned, there'll be no uh, uh, event in, uh, in July. So we will reconvene in August and in September. We would love to pay for your parking today if we haven't already done so. So on your way out, we can validate that. I hope everyone has a terrific day and great July and look forward to seeing you back in August. Thank you.